Do you feel like you're always putting others first and never making time for yourself? Does the overwhelm and exhaustion of constantly caring for everyone else prevent you from pursuing your biggest goals and dreams? My guest today went through this struggle, but emerged empowered after overcoming cancer to rediscover her voice and create an anti-fragile life and business. Courtney Elmer is a cancer survivor who helps entrepreneurs navigate adversity by embracing anti-fragility. By sharing the lessons learned from her inspiring story of renewal, Courtney teaches you how to grow through what you go through on your journey to success. Hello, incurable creators. I'm excited to bring you some bonus episodes featuring exclusive interviews from the 2023 Pot Up Virtual Podcasting Summit. Each Thursday for months, you're going to hear interviews from a diverse range of podcasting and marketing experts. My hope is these repurposed interviews will inspire you with new ideas and insights to take your podcast to the next level. And of course, remember to listen every Tuesday for our regular episodes of Podcasting Secrets as well. Now, let's dive into today's bonus interview from PodUp's 2013 Podcasting Summit. Hello, I'm Nathan William, the CEO of PodUp and your host for the Podcasting Summit. In this interview, I'm joined by Courtney Elmer, Courtney is the founder and CEO of The Effortless Life and the creator of Pod Launch. Courtney is a cancer survivor and she helps entrepreneurs embrace anti fragility. I'm excited to learn more about what that is. She has a background in psychology and uses this personal experience she has of, of overcoming cancer to help businesses thrive in this ever changing business environment. So, today with Courtney, we're going to talk about the insider secrets to launching a top 100 podcast. Thank you so much for joining us, Courtney. Nathan, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Courtney, can you start off by telling us what is anti-fragility? Yes, I get these looks every time someone says, anti-fragility, what, what is it that you teach? And really the short definition, Nathan, as best I can describe it, is growing through what you go through. And this has definitely been a huge part of my own journey it's been something that has undergirded all of my life and business experience, and it's something that now I teach as part of the entrepreneurial journey. We're all out there wanting to be successful, and there's plenty of people teaching you the, the next tactic, the next strategy to have success, but very few people are talking about how to fail better, how to better navigate failure and how to overcome and navigate the adversity that we are inevitably going to face on our journeys, both in our lives and in our businesses. So that's what anti-fragility is really about. And that's what my podcast is all about, where we bring on experts who are seven, eight-figure earners, but they're not necessarily talking about how they got to seven or eight figures. They're talking about the biggest myths along the way that they believed that led them down a bad path or the things that they've had to overcome to get there and sharing this wisdom and this knowledge and really making failure part of the conversation for us as entrepreneurs so that we can talk about it openly and feel like we're not alone in the struggles that we face. Can you share with us a little bit of your story, those challenges that you went through that helped shape who you've become? I'll start off with a story when I was nine years old. And I can remember this, Nathan, like it was yesterday. I was standing in the kitchen. My mom was at the sink washing dishes. And I was one of those sassy-mouthed nine-year-olds. I was always going off about something, very opinionated, very outspoken. My mom was always trying to, you know, channel that within me in the way that she knew how. And this one day, I'm going off about something. And she turns and she looks at me and she goes, Courtney, your mouth is what gets you into trouble. Go to your room. And I can remember just hanging my head. I walked down this very long hallway to the very end where my room was. And my mom had told me things like that before. She was trying to teach me to be respectful. I know that now. But for whatever reason that day, I internalized that message. And I began to believe that what I had to say wasn't important, that nobody wanted to hear it. And I began to mold myself and fit myself into the boxes that others built for me. But I lost sight of who Courtney was in the process. So that story really was the, the driver of a lot of what I experienced in my life from that point until about my mid-20s, where I was climbing the corporate ladder. I was doing well by all the world's standards. You know, I was successful. I had a nice car and I was moving up the ranks in my company and 
things were going well, and I just met the love of my life. We had gotten married, and we got back from our honeymoon, and I had a follow-up scheduled with my doctor. I had a sinus infection, and he's like, look, come back when you're back in town. Let's just make sure everything's all checked out. Sure, everything is fine, but make sure let's come back and see me. So I sat down at my doctor's office that day, and the doctor walks into the room and sits down and looks at me and says, Courtney, I know this is not the news that you expected to hear today but you have thyroid cancer. And I can remember, Nathan, it, my jaw hit the floor. Pretty sure it stayed there for a couple of minutes, too. I'm like gripping my brand new husband's hand, thinking in sickness and in health. Okay, here we go. And not knowing what my life was going to look like in the coming days and weeks and months. The one thing that my doctor said to me that day that still rings in my ears was that the biggest risk of this surgery was that your vocal cords could be severed. And the irony of that was not lost on me, as someone who chose not to use her voice for all of those years was now suddenly terrified of losing it. So when my doctor woke me up, I can remember standing over, you know, she was standing over the, the table where I was, or the bed, I guess. I was coming out of anesthesia and things were a little foggy. But I do remember this, and she said, Courtney, can you say my name? And it wasn't to see if the anesthesia had worn off, but it was to see if I could speak. And from that day forward, I knew that I couldn't waste the gift of my voice anymore. And that began the journey, and that's led me to where I am today, which never in a million years saw myself teaching podcasting or having a podcast. But of course, looking back at what I went through to get here, it's really interesting to see how those dots connect. And I can't imagine myself doing anything different. What an amazing message. But there's a lot of people listening to this who, who have a voice that they've kind of stuffed inside of them. And they feel like they're, they're needing to find their voice. They're needing to find a way to be able to share uh, that message that God has given them. What advice do you have for other people that might be in that situation? Yeah. You know, Nathan, this is what drives me. The voice, the gift of our voice, the power of our voice. Your voice is like a fingerprint. And we forget that. We forget that it is one of the things that makes us unique, truly unique. And so what I see a lot of people doing, especially in this day and age where we've got this explosion of all the social media channels, all the ways to be heard, theoretically being heard is easier than ever. And it's also harder than ever. Because now we can see other people using their voices and we aspire to be like that. But then we start to compare ourselves to those people and think, well, what we have to say is not as important as them. Or, oh, someone else is already out there talking about the thing I want to talk about. Surely nobody's going to listen to me. And I had all those same doubts, all those same fears, fear of judgment, fear of rejection, fear of saying something that would upset somebody, right? And they wouldn't like me, a recovering people pleaser, like, oh, that's like the worst thing imaginable. But... When I started using my voice more, the more I discovered who I was. And for someone listening right now who has definitely felt that lump in their throat when they go to speak, or who films the Instagram story 12 times because they're trying to get it right and they want to say it right because they're worried about what people are going to think, I've been there too. And using your voice, not only is it a gift, but it is a privilege it is a responsibility for us as entrepreneurs because your voice is what creates your legacy. So what I recommend is we first, we got to zoom out. We got to look at our life as a whole and think about it down the road. When, when people are at your funeral, what are they saying about you? How are they remembering you? Look at the great voices of our time. The Mother Teresa's, the Martin Luther King's, the Rosa Parks, the Nelson Mandela's. Where would we be in the world without their voices? And it doesn't mean that the road for them was easy. All of them, no matter what political background you have, you know, no matter what side you fall on, no matter what religious beliefs you have, there is adversity that you will face to using your voice. There will always be people who disagree with what you have to say. But if you can find it in your heart and find the conviction that this is what you need to do, that you've been given that purpose, like you said, by God, who's put this message on your heart for a reason. You are the messenger. You are the instrument. And the voice is the way that we share that message with the world. So we really have to 
get to a place where we can not only acknowledge the power of our voice, remove any of those beliefs that might be there that are limiting us, keeping us from using it, and then use it with the intention for positive change, to create meaningful change. Not just to use it to be a mouthpiece and to be heard and, you know, for eat an ego boost, but to create real meaningful change. Because at the end of the day, that is what you will be remembered for. But you won't be remembered for it without using your voice. We've talked about your background in psychology a little bit. And the focus of this interview is, is secrets to launching a top 100 podcast. How does psychology relate to achieving that goal? I love this question, Nathan, because so few people ask this. What we see all the time is people, business owners especially, who have heard how powerful podcasting can be as a lead generation tool, as a thought leadership tool. So they go out there and they think, okay, great. I have a topic I'm passionate about. I'm not afraid of talking to people about it, right? Sure, we might all have some fears internally, but I'm going to do the thing. I'm going to start this podcast. And what happens is one of two things. I see it all the time. Either you're someone who has toyed with the idea of launching a podcast, but you haven't yet because those doubts are getting in the way. Oh, well, what if I run out of things to talk about? Or what if the tech is more complicated than I think it's going to be? Or what if I don't have the time to keep up with it? I know consistency is so important. So maybe you bought the mic, but it's just sitting on a shelf in your closet. You haven't done anything with it yet. And the fear of not doing it right is keeping you from getting started. On the flip side of that, we've got those people that throw all caution to the wind. They're like, I'm just going to do it. They buy the mic, they plug it in, they start recording some episodes, they start publishing those. And they've likely been publishing those episodes for at least a year or more and still are only getting 30 to 50 downloads per episode. I always say less than a thousand because that seems to be the milestone, right? Thousand downloads per episode. It's like, oh, I've made it. Now people are going to start really paying attention. And so you feel like you're in your office recording episodes, talking to yourself like nobody's listening. And there's nothing more frustrating than that whenever you have a drive to reach people and to create real change, meaningful change. And so both sides of this, we have to look at first and foremost, who is your podcast for? It's not for you. It's for your listener. And we forget this because we go into podcasting, especially as business owners. You know, everything we do in our business is self-serving to some degree. And that's a good thing, because a lot of times that's how we measure our impact. How many leads are we bringing in? How much money, you know, are we making? How many enrollments are we getting into our programs this month? That's how we can measure the impact that we're making. But the big mistake that I see people making in the podcasting space is forgetting who their podcast really is for. It's for your listener. And if you are not crystal clear and if you do not have an intimate understanding of your listener's psychology, then it's going to be very hard to differentiate yourself from other podcasters out there in the space who are talking about the same thing or something very similar to you. So how do we attract those listeners to your show? How do we keep them listening? How do we convert them from leads to clients or listeners to leads and leads to clients? It all starts with psychology. So when people come to us and they're in that boat where they've had the podcast, it's not generating the downloads, they want more downloads, they want to grow the thing, we always start with what pillar one is for us, which is creating binge-worthy content. But when I say binge-worthy content, I don't just mean going out there and having like flashy content or the best content or saying everything so, you know, with all this swagger like this amazing podcast host. What I mean is knowing how to create subconscious demand for the content that you share. And there are many ways that we can do this, but it all comes back to the psychology of your listener. When you look at a listener, who are they? And when I ask that question, a lot of times I'll get answers, well, they're a woman, they're 35 to 45 years old, they likely have two kids, right? They're, they're married, this and that. I get a lot of demographic information. I don't get a lot of psychographic information. What you as the host need to be crystal clear on is What are the biggest problems that they're experiencing right now? Not how they feel about those problems. I'm not talking about them feeling overwhelmed or feeling tired and exhausted at the end of the day. But what are the problems causing those feelings? What are they doing to fix those problems that aren't working? How can you help them solve those problems to create a transformation? And what is the transformation that they want? 
Are there any beliefs that are getting in the way of them achieving that transformation? Are there any mistakes that they're making right now that are getting in the way of them achieving that transformation? And we can start by asking these questions to build out a psychographic profile for our listener that then you can align every aspect of your podcast to, every episode that you create, every episode title that you write, your show description, your name, down to the cover art. All of these pieces, I call them content gatekeepers, and we could talk more about that if you want. But attracting, keeping, and converting, that's the goal. But if any one of these pieces are out of alignment on a psychological level, it's going to be very difficult to do that and to create that demand to get someone choosing your show over your competition. Yeah. I, I think this concept of the psychology behind your user is really important. To help our audience internalize that and understand it a little bit better, can you give an example of, of maybe a company that you helped implement this psychology strategy? So there, there was a client that came to us. This was about six months ago. They would had their podcast for two years. They were averaging maybe at most 50 downloads per episode. And they came saying the things that most people say is, well, you know, I've missed a few weeks of publication. I haven't been publishing consistently. I know I need to do that in order to be successful. And I said, that's actually not the problem. And they were like, it's not? Like, no, it's not. I said, yeah, consistency is important. But differentiation is more important. And so the title of this podcast was Move Forward Anyway. And the person told me, I like the title. I think it's a great title. I said, well, what does it mean? And so he goes on to tell me about his work and how what he does in his field is he works with individuals, high achievers, corporate leaders, entrepreneurs who have huge dreams that they want to achieve but haven't taken action to do so. They're lacking clarity. They're lacking the plan. Maybe it's a book they want to write. Maybe they want to leave corporate and start a business, right? And he helps them in these transitions and in achieving their dreams. So a lot of the content of his podcast was centered around this idea of, okay, so you feel afraid, move forward anyway. And it, you understand it once you understand the context behind it. But to a potential listener, looking at that, the name, they have no idea what that means. For the record, I made the very same mistake when I started my podcast. And it was called The Effortless Life, which is the name of our, our company. Nobody knows what that means. Does that mean you want me to go, you know, meditate on the side of a mountain and become a Buddhist monk, right? And have an effortless life? You know, is it is it a parent that's trying to juggle the responsibilities of of parenting with work life and they're looking for work life balance? So the title is just one. The title of your show is just one of the five content gatekeepers. But after getting really clear on who his listener was, the problems, all the things I just mentioned, you know, the beliefs, the desires, all of that. We developed this psychological profile for his listener, and we found out that really the root of all the problems that they were experiencing was self-doubt. Every single problem was tied back to how they doubted their own ability to make this dream happen. And so we changed the title to Stop Doubting Your Dream. Much clearer. Much more targeted for that listener. Because that's going to be like a dog whistle to that listener who is experiencing doubt towards wanting to achieve their dream. That's not even the best part, though. We helped him relaunch his podcast. And within the first day, he had over a 1,000 downloads to his show. He ranked number 90 in the self-improvement category, which is very competitive. And he was so excited because he had never seen that kind of traction in his podcast before. And it was one simple tweak of many that we made, but one from that psychological perspective of knowing your listener. And when you can do this throughout your show, you've got their attention. They cannot ignore you. You've mentioned several times uh, these five content gatekeepers. Can you explain those to us? Think of your listener, right? What are their, what's their user experience like? And maybe put yourself in their shoes. If you listen to podcasts, and we've all done it, what's the very first thing you do when you're looking for a new podcast to listen to? You're either going to choose the category that you want to explore content within, or you're going to type in the search bar for a specific type of content that you're looking for. And then a list of podcasts is going to pop up. So when that list of podcasts pop up, what's the first thing you notice? It's going to be so quick. You might not even notice that you notice it, but it's the cover art. That's gatekeeper number one, the cover art. What we notice happening a lot is that people will create cover art to look like the other shows in their category. You need to do the opposite. 
because if you create cover art to look like the other shows in your category, it's going to blend in. Go look at the top shows in marketing right now. Amy Porterfield is the only one that's different. There's a lot of them that have warm, bold colors, oranges, pinks, yellows. Hers is gray and blue. There's a lot of them that have these big fonts. Some have like all these little tiny script fonts, can't hardly read them. Hers stands out. It's a very simple font. You can clearly see everything that, that it says. So right then and there, she's setting herself apart because she's drawing your eye to her show. Gatekeeper number two is your title. And I just gave you an example of a subtle but very powerful shift and how powerful that can be in the context of a title. Your title needs to be clear. Please don't be clever. If the title that you want is taken by someone else, this is a great opportunity for you to dig deeper, to stand out, to get even on a deeper level with your listener. I would recommend addressing a problem in your title at all times. I'll use Amy again as an example. Online marketing made easy. She even checked the box where she fit a keyword in there, right? Someone's going to be typing in online marketing. Guess who's going to pop up? But online marketing is a huge pain point for people. But she's here to simplify it for you. And she says it right there in her title. How many words is, should the ideal title be? I recommend no more than four. You can have a short tagline if you need to provide some more context. But four or less is ideal. More than that, you're going to start to crowd the, the cover art. And it's going to look busy. And it might be tough for your people to comprehend. But four main words is ideal. So if someone's looking and now you've got their attention from your art, it's drawn their eye, the name grabs you because it's a problem that you have, and you're positioning yourself as the expert to help them solve it, you've got their attention. So what do they do next? They're going to click. And what do they see next? Your show description. And your show description is the third content gatekeeper. And just to zoom out here for a minute, all of these gatekeepers are protecting the content inside your episodes. If a listener does not make it through all of these gatekeepers, they're never going to hear the amazing content in your episodes. So this is why if you're struggling to increase downloads, changing your call to action, changing the length of your episodes, changing what you talk about in your episodes, that's why that's not working. Because these gatekeepers need to be aligned first. All of the gates need to be open, metaphorically speaking. So your show description should address the problems that your listener is experiencing and how you specifically are qualified to help them solve those problems. Now, I don't mean give, you know, a four paragraph bio of how amazing you are, but rather show your listener how amazing you are by specifically calling out the problems they're experiencing and the desired transformation that they want. And then just a little bit of social proof. You know, we've helped over four dozen coaches and consultants launch top-ranked podcasts that convert listeners to clients and customers. I was just going to ask if you can give us an example of that. Give us an example of one other client that you've helped them find that problem and transformation, just so, so the audience can understand it a little more. So we have a client who we're in the process of working with right now. And her specialty is time management, productivity, simplification, and systems. And she works specifically with moms who feel like they're always the last on their list. Everyone else gets taken care of before they do. There's never any time left for mom at the end of the day. And there's a lot of problems that are created. And what you can do is just create a list of problems, right? Okay, she feels overwhelmed. Well, how does that overwhelm show up for her? How would you describe that overwhelm without using that word? We want to avoid feeling words. So... In working with this client, she came back and she said, okay, well, she's, you know, trying to get her kids out the door in the morning. She's scrambling, trying to cram in her work time during the day while the kids are at school. She's rushing to pick up. She's grabbing food. She's eating it on the go, right? Suddenly we start to get more of a picture of what this particular listener is experiencing in the course of their day. And so what we helped her hone in on was the fact that the main problem, the problem that the listener thinks is the problem, is that she doesn't have enough time. And we've all heard it before, right? Maybe, you know, if you're married and you've got your spouse, they're like, and oh, I just, if only I had more time. If only I had more time. You've probably said it yourself. That's what her listener thinks the problem is. So we're going to address that and also show that there's more to it than that. So in her description, we've helped her. Not only did we help her name her podcast, which is More Time for Mom, calls out who the person is calls out what the main problem is, and it speaks to what the person wants, which is 
more time, right? It's the problem and the solution almost all in one. And her description expands upon that. And you have that amazing word in there, mom, that's got your best SEO value. Yes, 100%. And it's clear who the podcast is for. We could have said more pod- more time for corporate leaders, right? But it's for mothers. And so now we're expanding upon that in a short one paragraph description, four to five sentences to show how we understand the listener's problem, how we're going to help them solve that problem. And then in order to solve that problem, the next step for them to take is go listen to an episode. And so we work that we take and it just kind of translates down, right? So her cover art's design, her name is designed specifically. When that listener reads the description, they get more of a sense that this is for me. This is relevant to me. I'm in the right place. And then what's that listener going to do next? They're going to scroll at past episode titles, right? They're going to scroll through recent episodes. They're going to see the titles. And if a title grabs them, they'll click through and they'll read the episode description. And those are our final two content gatekeepers, your episode title and your episode description. Now keep in mind, people are skimming, which means that they're just looking for what's relevant to them. They're not going to sit there and read every word that you've shared. So we want to keep it short, and we want to keep it focused on the problems that your listener is experiencing. And so if they see a title that says, how to get four hours a week back on your calendar, That might be nice. They might say, okay, that's interesting. But they might not really believe that's true. Because remember, right now they're experiencing a major problem of not having enough time. So we can suddenly make our titles more powerful when we say something like, why everybody is wrong about time management. Well, now you've got my attention because I've tried time management strategies. And guess what? They didn't work for me, right? In the context of this example, right? For this listener. And so now I'm going to click through to see what that's about because I knew I was right. The time management is just a load of crock and people are not even, you know, it doesn't work. Right? So they click through, they read the description. And if all of those gates are open, they'll click play. Then they're going to hear your content. Then you can take them deeper. But if we don't get them there, you'll lose them. And you're going to continue losing them to your competition. You can think of these gatekeepers, if you want another analogy or metaphor for this, like holes in your bucket. And if you've got a hole in your bucket, it's going to leak and those listeners are going to fall out. So we want to make sure all those holes are plugged so that we can not only attract the listeners, but we can keep them and ultimately convert them. That's a very valuable strategy. Um, In addition to these five content gatekeepers, what are the most important things that podcasters need to know to achieve their goal of being a top 100 podcaster? Yes. So I mentioned earlier that pillar one is the psychology piece. There's two other pillars. So yes, we talked a lot about the psychology today, but just at a high level to take a look at what those other two pillars are. The second is a launch and relaunch strategy. This is what's going to help you rank when combined with a binge-worthy content system. This is what's going to help you get in the top 200 on Apple. Ideally, the top 100. If someone's looking on their desktop computer, you can see the top 200 podcasts in any given category. On a phone, it's the top 50 to 100, depending on your phone. So, of course, the goal is the top 100. But period, if you're in the top 200, you're ranking, right? That's what we want to see. And we want to see that not just once but week over week. And this is where pillar three comes in, which is a long-term audience building formula. Because yes, it's one thing to have an amazing podcast that's aligned to your listener, that differentiates you from your competition, and that makes it easier for your perfect listener to discover you. But then we also want to make sure that your podcast can get on the charts. Because unless you're doing a lot of work on the SEO side, Podcasting still has a long way to go with SEO. And so it's harder to discover a podcast if it's not in the charts for those that are browsing podcasts to listen to. But we don't just want to get in the charts once. We want to stay there. And so that's where the long-term formula to build your audience comes into play. 
How do we then, once our podcast is up and running, shift gears and know what dials to tweak in order to continue to attract and keep listeners, but to also measure the conversions from our podcast to our business? And it's amazing when you have this dashboard built for your podcast, where you've got the content system, you've got a launch and relaunch system, and then you've got a long-term audience building formula to get you and keep you in the charts. Then it becomes a measure of just tracking and tweaking over time. And so you can measure that. And we see that. I can do an interview like this and I can show you exactly who came from this interview, who booked a call with me, and who enrolled into our program. And I can do that for every podcast interview I've ever done. And I could do that for our episodes on our own podcast. This data is incredible because suddenly now you're an entrepreneur who's not just having a podcast for the sake of having a podcast because someone told you you should or that you'd be great at it or that you want more leads and followers. But now you actually have a mechanism within your business that you can see the impact that it's making, both in the world at large as you use your voice to build your legacy and behind the scenes within your business. Yeah, not doing that tracking is definitely a huge mistake that I've made before. And what are the biggest mistakes that you see podcasters making that are stopping them from reaching that top 100 podcast goal? One of the biggest ones, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but we can dive deeper into it, is the idea that consistency is the key to success. Consistency is important. It's important in everything that you do. If you don't work out consistently, well, you're not going to build muscle. If you don't eat right, well, you might have some health problems, right? If you don't do that consistently, it's going to compound over time. And yes, the same is true in podcasting. But what matters more in podcasting is knowing how to communicate to your listener why your show is different. It's the differentiation piece. And not enough hosts are leaning into this. So I see that as a mistake because it's one of the things that's so simple once you dial it in. And once it's dialed in, it's dialed in. You don't have to do it all the time. You know, it's a a one and done type thing. But without it, it's going to be a lot harder to grow. Another mistake that I see people making is that they don't have a strategy in place for growth long term. They're throwing a lot of spaghetti at the wall, but they're not sure what's sticking. And I hear it from people all the time. They're like, well, I'm posting to social media. You know, I do those little audiogram clips. I share those out to my Instagram stories. I write a LinkedIn article. I repurpose the video onto YouTube. Uh, Let's see, what else? I go to conferences. You know, I talk about my podcast. and I send out emails to my list to tell them a new episode, right? They give me this laundry list of things that they're doing, but they can't tell me which of those are actually moving the needle. And so this is where, you know, if you're using a podcast to create leverage within your business, within your company to get some of your time back, so you don't have to spend all that time you know, creating all these reels and TikToks and all these things for your marketing and so that you can potentially save some money on, a, on an ads budget as well, then we need to know what's actually making the impact. And like you just said, Nathan, the tracking is so important. That's another mistake that I see a lot. And then on the front end of that, for someone who doesn't even have a podcast, one of the biggest things is that you're spreading yourself thin across two, three, four more platforms, trying to build them all simultaneously without a cornerstone in place that links them all together, right? Making them all work together like one cohesive mechanism. Or relying solely on short-form content without a long-form content strategy in place. Kind of like having a bike with a flat tire. You're going to get somewhere but you're not going to be able to go as far as fast. So these, are, these might not be the mistakes that come to mind for most people, right? Most people think, oh, well, maybe I don't have the right microphone, right? Or maybe I'm not publishing consistently enough, or I need to release two episodes a week, not one. Or, you know, I need to change up this or that about my podcast. But really, it's, it's what I just mentioned and everything else we've talked about today, too. Not having enough depth on the psychology side to create subconscious demand for your show. Thank you so much, Courtney, for sharing your time and wisdom with us today. If our audience has enjoyed what you've shared and they want to learn more about you and your products and services, what are the best ways for them to do that? Yes. So two places that you can go, the first and foremost being the workshop that I host on a regular recurring basis. And everything we covered here today, I dive into in more depth in that workshop, all three of those pillars. And I teach you what they are, what you need, 
to install them into your business for your podcast and how to use them together as a system to scale your show. Not only to get in the top 100, but to stay there. So if you're interested in joining me for that, the workshops are completely free. There is no pitch. This is not like a pitch fest. It's pure, straight value. Come hang out with me. I can talk with you and answer your questions about your podcast or about the podcast you're thinking of starting. So you can go to antifragileentrepreneurship.co forward slash workshop to get all the details there and to save your seat. And then the second place is my podcast, Antifragile Entrepreneurship. You can get it wherever you get your podcast. Either type that in or if that's too long to type, just type in my name. It'll pop right up. And I would love to have you hanging out there with us week over week as well. And for those of you that are watching or listening, if you haven't yet looked at the bonus VIP package, please click on the button below and you can see four extra special bonuses that you can get at absolutely no cost to you. And I wish you success as you strive to become a top 100 podcast. And here are my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, anti-fragility means growing through your challenges and struggles, using challenges and setbacks as opportunities for growth. Number two, Courtney suppressed her own voice for years after being told as a child that her opinions didn't matter. After surviving cancer, she rediscovered the importance of using her voice. Number three, your voice is unique, like a fingerprint. It's your responsibility to use it to create positive change. Number four, to attract and keep podcast listeners, you need to deeply understand the psychology and problems of your target listener. Number five, the five key content gatekeepers are cover art, title, show description, episode titles, and episode descriptions. All five must align with your listener's psychology. Number six, having an effective podcast launch and relaunch strategy can help you rank in the top podcast charts. Number seven, consistency matters in podcasting, but differentiation matters more. And finally, number eight, tracking the data and impact of your podcast is crucial. Otherwise, you don't know what content and platforms are actually moving the needle. If you're looking for a great all-in-one podcasting platform with more than 35 integrated modules, I recommend you check out PodUp and get a free trial at podup.com. Thanks for joining us for this episode, and I wish you success and learning from your struggles and hardships to become a better, stronger version of yourself.